Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Uh, today we've had Code Forces round 672, and I thought I would make a stream today solving this contest virtually. And here I am. It finished uh, half an hour ago. So hopefully some people can find it interesting after they have just finished them on their own. Uh, and as we can see, system testing is still running. It means that I cannot submit my solutions to this contest yet, and I cannot start virtual participation, but I thought that instead of waiting, I will just start solving the problems and not submit them to the system, and hopefully they will all be correct eventually. But maybe not, then we'll have to find the bugs. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, this test is quite slow today. It happens. I think it depends on the number of test cases, the number of participants, and so on. So in some cases it's faster, and sometimes it's slower. Is it possible to enable lower qualities? What quality is now the only one? Is it 720? This test structure, it's already 720? Yeah, but I think if you if it's 720, then maybe you cannot... If you cannot lower it, then sorry, I think... I cannot do anything about it. But last time I had 720 and there was an option to choose the to choose lower qualities, but I think it was just dependent on the load on Twitch. Mm. Okay, I will not restart the stream. Hopefully 720 is best for most people. All right. So here we are. We had five problems and one of them had two subtasks. And well, let's go. Let's just solve the problems and then we'll submit after systems. This test is over. Yeah, it's 35% that it's, it's actually stuck. At 35 for quite some time. Whatever. Let's go. I don't care about the time or anything. I can even take my time to read this, even though obviously it it just makes no sense for me to read it if I'm in a contest. For God's sake, what? Uh, I've got one hour. Okay, fair. Hopefully I can solve it faster than in one hour. Um, test chamber cubes. We need n cubes. Cube i has a volume ai. We have to place the cubes in such a way that they would be sorted in non-increasing order by their volume. volume. And I can exchange two neighboring cubes. If needs more than that number of exchange operations, he won't do. Okay, so 
this problem is easy. Um, so the first question is supposed to have some cube volumes, a1, a2, an, and we want to find the number of exchanges of neighboring cubes needed to sort this sequence. And it is well known <coughs> that the number of exchanges we need is uh, the number of inversions. So to sort a1, a2, a n, we need a number of exchanges is equal to number of inversions in a. That is the number of pairs ij such that ai is greater than aj and i is smaller than j, right? So And now the question is how many inversions can we have in a sequence of lengths n? Uh, max number of inversions in a in sequence of lengths n is n times n minus 1 over 2. Because it's just the number of pairs ij, it happens if the sequence is strictly decreasing. And so our hero of the problem will not do the work if the number of exchanges is more than this value minus 1. So basically, if it's equal to n times n minus 1 over 2, then he won't do this volume work. So I think that we have to check if the, num if the sequence is strictly decreasing. If it's strictly decreasing, then we need exactly this number of exchanges. And then the answer is no. Otherwise, we can save at least one exchange, so the answer is yes. So... We we input the sequence and if we find any pair of elements <coughs> that are not strictly decreasing, then we can break and if it's sorted, then we output no, otherwise we output yes. Okay, yes, yes, no. Uh, check for duplicates also. I don't think that I need to check for any duplicates. If they are equal, if neighboring elements are equal, then I will output yes. And that's correct. So it is sorted if a1 is greater than a2 and so on, greater than an. How the number of pairs is equal to n types times n minus 1 over 2? Uh, Uh, so we want to find the number of pairs ij such that i is less than j. So we have for i equal to 1, we have n minus 1 pairs. Because j can go from 2 to n. For i equal to 2, we can have j from 3 to n, so that's n minus 2 pairs and so on, and I'm equal to n minus 1, we'll have j equal to n, one pair. So in total, we have n minus 1 plus n minus 2 plus, and so on, plus 1, and it's an arithmetic progression, and the sum is this. Okay. Uh, no, bull machine, unfortunately, I think I cannot change the quality of the stream. So we'll have to have what we have. 
I think 720 is the best I can have right now. Okay. Uh, I guess it should be correct. Let's go to problem B, I think. Okay, this one is shorter at least. Test one, two, two, two. Okay, let's test. So is it one test case with two numbers two and two, or is it four numbers one, two, two, two? I guess this. Okay, it's yes. Looks correct to me because we need to make zero exchanges. Okay. Uh, okay, so basically I can just ignore this part of the problem and just read it from here. But maybe it's nice, I don't know. Danik urgently needs a rock and lever. The easiest way to get these things is to ask Hermit Lizard for them. And Hermit Lizard agreed to give Danik the lever, but to get a stone, Danik needs to solve the following task. Okay, sure. And problem setters usually come up with those stories. And I think it's up to them. I don't mind them too much, but sometimes when you figure out that the first three paragraphs are just useless, it might be annoying. Uh, okay, a positive integer n and array a and the number of pairs i, j such that i is less than j and and is greater or equal to xor. Okay. ICPC problems do have a lot of stories, but the thing is, I think that ICPC, in ICPC problems, the story is usually connected to the problem. It's not just some random stuff. Like here, this story has nothing to do with the problem. So I think that's the difference. Yeah, using midnight commander like a prompt, kind of. Uh, okay, so what does this condition mean? AI and AJ greater than or equal to AI XOR AJ. So let's see. Let's start from just number of one bit of a single bit. So zero and zero is equal to zero and it is equal to zero which is equal to zero XOR zero. Zero and one is equal to zero and it's less than 1, which is 0, XOR 1. Uh, okay, same goes for 1 and 0. And for 1 and 1, we have 1, which is greater than 0, which is 1 and 1. Lizard is good clue, is it? I don't know. Yeah, it is my birthday tomorrow but not today. So, we can see that if both bits are zeros, then we have zero, so it's equal. And in other cases, it is not equal. So, if we have at least one one in the numbers, then we always have an equality. And when we do bitwise operations, so we have some numbers like this, one number is this, and one number is this, we can have, let's say this is A, and this is B. We can have A and B equal to 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and you can, we can have A, X or B equal to 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, right? And when we want to compare these two numbers, we 
can just compare them in the first position where they differ. And here the first position is already the first bit. So we can see that in the end we have 0 and in XOR we have 1. And another case to consider is if A and B have the same highest bit. You can see that in A and B we have 1 here and in A XOR B we have 0 here. So the final condition actually is that uh, A and B is greater than or equal to A X or B uh, if and only if A, A's and B's highest bits match, right? That's the, that's the condition. Just because only the highest bit matters. If it's different, then, then in the position of the highest bit of the bigger number, we'll have a bad inequality. And if the highest bits match, then end has 1 in that position, XOR has 0 in that position, so we have the required, the required inequality. Okay, so now the problem is how to count the pairs. And we can just uh, see that a pair is good if their highest bits match, so we can just classify the numbers on their highest bits. And count the number of pairs inside each of the, class, each of the classes. Uh, okay. So let's say we have some kind of array of counts. Now we have 20, 20, 32 bits, so we can just count like this. And to, like the best way, like the shortest way to do this would be to just uh, count leading zeros in the number. So it would be built in count leading zeros in AI. This is uh, GNU GNU, I guess, C++ specific function, which counts the number of leading zeros in AI. So basically I can do it like this. And I have classified the numbers now. The number of pairs can be large, so we have to use long long here. And here we also have to use long long in multiplication, not to get Overflow and again the number of pairs is this the number of pairs in the same class. So let's check. One, three, two, zero, zero. Okay. Uh, if the stream is error two thousand, I guess reload helps. Um, all right, and you don't have to use this function, so another way to do it would be uh, find the highest power of 2, which is uh, not greater than the number. We can do it like this as well. It's probably not much slower. Uh, so we are counting pairs for any possible bit which might be the matching highest bit position. Yeah, something like that. So we classify all the numbers on their highest bit. For each highest bit we count the number of numbers with this highest bit. And then for each highest bit, we just add the number of pairs of numbers with the same highest bit. Uh, Built-in count leading zeros is, well, 
formally it's not a uh, constant time it's log of machine word size so in our case it's int so like the machine word size i mean log of the size of the integer we ask for so it's 32 so i think it should be like five simple operations i mean so formally from asymptotics point of view it would not be constant time if we include machine word size in the asymptotics it uses a complicated bitwise operation just one of them i don't think it uses one bitwise operation i think it uses like five of them pretty sure and five is exactly the logarithm of 32 not a coincidence all right how system testing going 62 all right going well let's go for c1 uh maybe let's go for c2 actually well whatever let's read c1 first i would go for c2 most probably if i was just doing the contest live but it doesn't matter here we have no swap operations okay uh, and pikachu and they have strengths we can choose any non-empty subsequence okay the strength is some alternative sum of elements of the subsequence and sometimes we swap them and we want to find the maximum strength of the army in the beginning and after each operation okay Um, okay, so the first question is how do we find the answer? To just one query I mean just without queries how do you find the best total uh, we can definitely use DP we can definitely use DP even though I, I guess that you can actually use DP with segment 3 for C2 but okay let's just start with C1 just because I can because I think that, no, I don't know. I guess segment three is still fine. It should not be too hard, but maybe there is easy, easier way. So we are sol solving C C1. So we just are solving for no queries. And DP should be easy. Why are the values at most N? I'm not sure, but okay. Uh, you have to, to choose non-empty subsequence, all right. And it's a minus a plus a and so on, okay. So I think that we just want to find the maximum and the minimum possible subsequence. Basically, we can do it like we can do it DP. We, we don't actually need arrays here. We can just use variables, but we can also do it with arrays. Uh, so mxi is um, max strength uh, of a team chosen from ai, ai plus one, and so on, and a, a n minus one. And mn is min. The same conditions, but maximum and minimum. Let's not copy paste. 
Uh, obviously, the problem asks us to find the maximum. So if we can calculate such values, then we can just output a max of zero here. But why do we find the minimum? And the reason is easy, because if we want to take some element to the sequence, then we can see that the signs will start to alternate from the second element. So basically, we can re rewrite this condition. So we have, uh, we want to maximize a, b1 minus a, b2 plus a, b3 minus a, b4 plus and so on, which is the same as maximize a, b1 minus, and then we put a, a bracket here. And we can see that if we put everything else beside the first element into brackets, then this part will be the same definition of the strengths, but it is negated. And if we want to maximize it, then we want to maximize the whole expression. Then we want to minimize the value in the brackets. So we just say that maximum of i is equal to maximum of we either ignore the element i, then we just go to a max i plus 1, we just don't use i. Or if we use i, then you have ai, which is a b1 in this case, minus the minimum on the suffix. And for m and i, we have the same conditions but minimum and maximum reversed. All right, so let's check C1. Three, two, nine, okay, looks good. So it's quite easy. Uh, okay, people said segment three was timing out for C2. Sequence is a permutation. Yeah, it actually is. This number are on the all distinct, but then you write that it's a permutation here. Okay, so people are writing that C2 has a much simpler solution than DP plus segment three. Okay, so uh, DP plus segment three is obviously what I would go for. By the way, let's mark the problems with yellow maybe just a moment since we can't test them yet no this yellow is not great okay this is orange but Whatever. Uh, yeah, it is a permutation because here we can see that they are on. So it's distant at most n. Okay. C1 can be done without dp. I guess if C2 can be done without dp, then C1 should also be doable without dp. Uh, at least without dp plus segment 3. Okay. Maybe let's think about C2 in this case. So the dp plus segment tree is kind of the obvious solution, but let's see if we can do better. Well, not, not like obvious, but kind of straightforward if you know the technique. Mm. Okay, how can we actually use the condition that this is a permutation? I don't actually see a good way to check it, to, to use it, to use it. How system test doing? 73. All right. Hmm.
can we somehow figure out this structure? Like, I mean, do these numbers have any structure? So we can see that mx and mn are not non-increasing and non-decreasing. So every next value is one of those. I guess it should be actually yeah, I think that should be symmetric, right? So, is it true that mx is equal to mn uh, minus mn for any position? Uh, well, obviously not, because no, for one element it's its value and zero, right? Yeah because there is some difference here, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, C2 height permutation. I mean, C C1 height permutation, so if you Notice that C1 has permutation, then there is no reason for C2 not to have permutation. Okay. MXI, maximum of MXI plus 1, AI. I don't see any solution yet. Hmm. And I don't really see how not to use how to use the permutation property. Uh, let's output some debug stuff. Maybe we can figure out when we look at the numbers. Yeah, so after every number, one of the values change, changes, and the other one stays the same. Is it obviously true? Probably not. Maybe both can stay the same, but probably not both can change. Seven minus four. Interesting. I mean,
Well, from looking at these values, I feel like the answer is just the sum of differences in positions where the sequence is decreasing. I'm not sure if there is an easy explanation to that. So I feel like the solution is just um, something like that. Uh, no. One, one, and seven. No, current minus next is what I wanted to write. Yeah, either I consider the first element or here I consider the last element here. So it's three to nine. So it's correct for the sample. And then if this solution is correct, then it's actually easy and much easier to change it into a working solution for C2, just because this total doesn't change much. When we just swap two elements, we can just consider four positions the swapped positions and the previous positions to them and just see how the dis how the difference changes but okay so let's see uh oops let's see if we assume that this solution is correct, then uh, okay. So let's have a function like this. I think it's pretty useful, which will return the value at position i. So. Um, what is the best way to do it? We can have equal positions swapped, but why? Um, okay. But for some reason we have L not greater than R, okay. Okay. And let's also return zero here, just to be sure. And I think it would be easier. So we subtract the value from position x minus one from position x. And we can also subtract the value from position y minus one and y. Then we swap a ax and y, a y and we add all these values back. And there is a small bug in this code. Uh, try generating a precompiled header for bits stdc++. No, maybe I should actually consider it. Hmm. Is it an easy thing to do? Hmm. If you have any tips, you're welcome, because I would definitely appreciate that. Um, speed up GCC compile time. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I haven't seen this blog. Mm, thank you. I will definitely take a look. 
Is it suitable for Windows? Yeah, I guess there's nothing specific to Linux here. Should be fine. Okay, I'll check it. Thank you. So the bug here is that if x is not equal to y minus 1, then we have to do this. Otherwise, we subtract it twice, the same position. So you just copy to your local directory. OK, I'll check it. Thank you. So yeah, so x minus 1, x, y minus 1, and y are the four positions that, ch that change. But if x and y are the neighboring positions, then we have to not to subtract and add it twice. So let's see if we can pass the sample test case. Three, four, two, 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 nine, ten, 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 nine, eleven. Looks correct. Okay. So I'm ready to submit C two now. And I have not written the segment three solution, which a lot of people would like to see, right? Maybe not a lot, but whatever. Um, how do I explain the solution easily? How do I understand it, maybe? Because this is what I kind of figure out, figured out from the formulas, from the output values, like literally. If you take a look at these values, uh, I mean, that's just how formally I understood what happens here, right? So we have some max and i plus 1 and mn, i plus 1, max and min, whatever. And we have these formulas. And basically, we have to consider two cases. Uh, let's say a i is less than m x i plus one plus m n i plus one. Okay, then what do we have? Uh, we have that a i minus m n i plus one is less than m x i plus one. Uh, okay, so. Assume that this this is true. Uh, this is less than mx i plus one, so mx i is equal to max i plus one. But at the same time, we have this condition, but here we have minimum, so mn i is actually equal to a i minus mx i plus one. So we can see that if this condition is true then this is how the values change. And then there is another case. The other case is greater than or equal, let's say, because equal is actually can, is impossible here, but never mind. Assume that it can be equal. So we have this condition and the other condition. If we just move max i plus 1 to the left or min i plus 1 to the left, so we have max i equal to a i minus min i plus 1, and min i is equal to min i plus 1, right? That's what happens here. So we have two cases, and in one case we have these formulas, actually, which are equivalent to the formulas above. I just opened up to the maximum and minimum, and these are the formulas if AI is greater than or equal to the sum. And another thing to note that in both cases, we have max i plus min i equal to AI, just because in both cases it is true. Right? In this case it's true, and in this case it's also true. And so it means that here, when we are we're assuming stuff, we were comparing it to a i plus 1. And here we, are, we were also comparing it to a i plus 1. And 
Finally, we can see how the answer changes, how the max value changes. So in this case, uh, does, it doesn't change. And in this case, it increases by how much? Uh, basically, well, it increases by AI plus minus AI plus one, but if you just write down the stuff, I guess it should be easy to see. Is it? Yeah, it should be easy. So that's what we can see. So the maximum of zero is the total of all these values. Uh, okay. And so that's how we get to this solution. I don't know if there's any reasonable explanation because my, my explanation is just working through the formulas and just looking at them from different perspective, like trying to figure out how to simplify the formulas here. Okay, that's it for problem C. So hopefully the tutorial contains some reasonable explanation. I'll take a short two minute break and then I'll be back with problem D. Hello again. H hello, hello. Why do some people use int64 underscore t and not 11? Not sure. I don't think that's important. Maybe we can ask those people. I tried to actually use int64 underscore t in my own codes, but Mm, after some time, I understood that I'm too used to lon lon, and it's just easier to type. And also, some people use type def lon lon ll or using, and I just don't like that. I just don't like that in general, like as a style. So I'm typing lon lon every time. Okay. In old code force problems, there was warning not to use lon lon instead of use in 64. I think it was not about long long, it was about uh, print f format specifier. Uh, int long and long long are inconsistent on different platforms. Yeah, that could be true because, but for now I think it's quite the same on at least on compassive programming platform, but yeah. It's not like super specified. So in 64 is definitely 64 bytes, but who knows what long long can mean, right? And there was also a question, how many problems as a beginner should solve on a daily basis? I guess as many as possible and as many as you enjoy. That's also a very important point. Okay. We have our old friend 998244353. We 
we have n lamps. I mean, yeah, I can also read this. Ori and Sign have overcome many difficult challenges. They finally lit the shrouded lantern and found Guman Seal. The key to the forlorn ruins. When they tried to open the door to the ruins, nothing happened. Ori was very surprised, but Sign gave the explanation quickly. Clever Guman decided to make an additional defense for the door. I wonder how many times I mispronounced some names in this text. Okay, so we have N lamps. We know the time of turning on and off for the ice lamp. And to open the door, we have to choose K lamps in such a way that there will be a moment of time they will all be turned on. And we have to find the number of ways to pick such K lamps. So I feel like this problem appeared before, but whatever. Maybe I have just seen too many problems. But I think it doesn't matter. So we want to find the number of subs. So we have n line segments, basically. And we want to find the number of subsets of k, exactly k segments, which have, a non, mm, which have at least one point in their intersection. Right, so from three segments one one to two three three, ch choose one of them. It's three ways. Choose two zero ways because no two of them intersect. Choose three if all are one three two three three three. It's one because choose all of them. Right. Yeah, we have explanation here as well. So here we have one two one three two three two four three four three five four five. All right. So the problem is pretty easy. Maybe it's even easier than C, two. And from the number of accepted, yeah. D is actually easier than C2. Fair enough. So the solution goes like this. Uh, we have and segments, your exams are starting from tomorrow, good luck, hope you pass them. So the solution is, let's sort all segments in decreasing, okay, in increasing order of L, okay? Uh, the way I usually do it is instead of reordering the pairs LR, I just create an array which corresponds to the order of segments. So I want to fill the array with consecutive numbers. And then, okay, let's do this. And then I want to sort them, let's say in non-decreasing order of L. And then suppose we pick segment, we, okay, so suppose that we now have them all non-increasing, non-decreasing. Uh, suppose we pick segments, uh, segment one, segment two, segment K. So what condition do we have? We want all these segments to be intersecting in at least one point. What does it mean? Uh, okay, so we want segments S1, S2, SK to intersect in at least one point. So, which is equivalent to the maximum of their left borders should be not greater than the minimum of their right borders, right? That's what we have. That's the condition. 
what does it mean? Um, it means that this segment from this point to this point is the actual intersection. If we have greater here, then we have empty intersection. Okay, and suppose that we have segments with indices in increasing order, then actually maximum of their else is already known. It's just LSK. So this is equivalent to this, just because we know that the maximum of left borders is the last one. But we don't know anything about the right borders. So what we do now is let's loop let over and let's fix the last segment we take. And we want to know the number of segments which are suitable for this condition. So this is actually equivalent to LSK not greater than RSRS1 and LSK is not greater than RS2 and so on. And this is obviously true, but the rest of the conditions are mean meaningful. We can write it here as well. We can write just K minus one here. We need k minus one conditions. Um, let's go through segments in the order. And the question is how many segments satisfy this condition? That their right border is not less than our current left border. So let's just have a multi set of all. Uh, right borders, so it will be called R's, and we go through left borders in non-increasing, non-decreasing order, so we can only remove elements from the multiset now. So while the multiset is not empty, and its first element is less than like the first element is the smallest element, is less than li, we just erase the smallest element. And he here we see that we have the size of the set is equal to the number of elements, the number of segments, which satisfy the condition that their index is smaller than the index of the current segment, and their right border is at least the left border of the current segment. So this is the number of these segments. And so we have to add, actually, the number of ways. Uh, OK, so this is binomial coefficient. Number of ways to choose k minus 1 segments from count segments uh, to the answer. That's what we have to do. Um, and basically, I already have the function which does it. It's not very efficient, but it does the work, does the job. This line is not actually meaningful, but okay, whatever. This test is done. Good news. Oh, I can now submit. Cool. Uh, how did it finish, by the way? And the Gorian one solving all the problems in 32 minutes. Great. So we have a lot of unofficial participants, and we also have some official ones. Congrats to the winners. So quite a lot of people sold E. We will take a look at it later. Okay, so I think I'm done with D. Let's check if our solution is correct. Okay, it's obviously 
Obviously, it's not correct, but why? Oh, yeah, because, again, like I showed my compiler flags, this one is actually quite verbose. But yeah, obviously, it, it, this has to be strict, because comparison of the element with itself should return false. And you have zero. Zero is not correct, because we forgot to insert elements into our multiset. We only erase them. So we have to insert the right border of the current segment after we consider it. OK, 9 is correct. 3 is correct. 0 is correct. 1 is correct. And 7 is correct. Let's submit our problems now. Mm. Okay, let's go actually in the usual order. Okay, A. Mm. B. Let's submit both solutions to C1. And C2. Okay, so the two solutions to C1 run in the same very small time, but the second solution took less memory, as expected. And some people said that the segment tree solution to C2 could time out for some people, but I guess this one is very fast, not even close to timing out. And D is testing. Okay, so we are almost done. We have A, B, C1, C2 correct, and D probably also correct. And we have E remaining. Okay, let's go to E. Mm. 80 integers from 0 to 1. Interesting. Okay. <clears throat> we stand in a line, number from 1 to n. Oh, this, this problem has no useless paragraphs, surprisingly. And lemmings, some of the lemmings hold shields. Okay. Protection is the number of protected pairs, such pairs that both don't hold a shield, but there is a shield between them. We choose a lemming with a shield and give one or two one of the two orders. Okay, D is accepted. So problem E is interesting. At least it looks interesting, I, I think. So Um, hmm. 
Okay. So the problem is we have a sequence of zeros and ones, and in one second we can actually swap any two neighboring elements. Because here it's written that we can give a shield to the left neighbor, so it means that if it's zero one, we can transform it into one zero. And this line means that if we have one zero, we can transform it to zero one. So we can just swap any two elements because obviously zeros and ones are not like swapping two zeros is not useful and swapping two ones is not great either. And we want to find for each k, uh, for each k, we want to calculate the following. We can do at most k swaps of neighboring elements, and we want to maximize the number of pairs of zeros which have one, which have at least one between them. Okay. Um, so one thing to notice is that we can actually transform the um, the goal function into a different one. So here we want like we are asked to maximize the number of pairs which have a one between them pairs of zeros which have a one between them but instead we can minimize the number of pairs of zeros which don't have a one between them and this is actually what is the number of pairs of zeros which don't have a one between them this is just uh, we only need to consider segments of zeros of consecutive zeros and for each such segment we just find the number of pairs inside this segment and we just subtract it like we, we add all of these numbers for all segments of zeros and that's how we get the answer yeah the stream has not ended so for example in this case we have six zeros and it means that we have 15 pairs of zeros overall but we have four zeros here and we have six pairs inside these four zeros so we have 15 minus six nine good pairs right so the, the first value is nine here and similarly here we have three pairs overall minus three pairs inside this segment okay so we want to minimize the number of pairs inside consecutive zeros. Um, okay, and how do we approach it? Mm. How do we approach it? This is DP. This is quite, I don't know, it's hard. Okay, so, so the first idea is DP. The second idea is that uh, how do we find, okay, let's say we have two, sequence of, two sequences of zeros and ones. How do we find the number of exchanges we need to transform one into another? And obviously we want these two sequences to contain the same number of zeros overall and actually this value will be as follows so let's say we want to we have two sequences one is as follows and let's say b is something different but something that has six zeros okay so one zero zero one zero one zero zero one zero one one okay let's see and to find the number of swaps we need to transform one into another we can find the position position positions of zeros in a 
are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And positions of zeros in B are 1, 2, 4, 6, 7, 9. And number of exchanges required to transform A into B is equal to the sum of post A i minus post B i and absolute values here. That uh, doesn't the problem tag give a hint? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I, I didn't mean saying that it's DP. I did not mean like to be too clever. <laughs> I wasn't looking at that, but sure. Maybe I should hide tags in future for virtual. I mean, the thing is I'm not doing virtual participation because system test was running too slow, so I had to just solve the problems. I think in virtual participation you don't, don't see the tags. But yeah, maybe I should hide tags for usual problems. So, this is the formula we need. The number of exchanges is the sum of distances of the first zero to the second zero. I mean, the first zero in A to the first zero in B, second zero in A to second zero in B, and so on. Just because we never want to swap two zeros, and it just means that it just means that we have to move the first zero to the position of the first zero in B. So we just move it. And so on. Show text for unsolved problems. Yeah. Where is the... Is it in the problem set? Is it here? Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Okay, now I have no idea what this problem is. Do, does anyone have a... a can anyone give me a hint what topic is this problem? Because I, I just can't figure it out. It's too hard now. Okay. So we, we know this formula. And now we will use dp. dp will be... Let's just put zero... Let's just go from left to right and form our sequence that we are aiming at. And the sequence will be... Okay, so the so dp state will be uh, i is how many elements we have put. Uh, zeros is the number. Is it zeros or zeros? I'm bad at English. F of t. Okay, thank you, thank you. I'll try f of t. Okay, someone said zeros. Maybe I shouldn't. Uh, Maybe I should listen, yeah. Uh, I, zeros is the number of zeros we have put into our sequence. Um, this distance is the sum of distances of the first of those zeros we have put to their desired positions. Oh, it's zeros, is it? Okay, I have to check. People say both are acceptable. Okay, I don't care. Uh, so distance is the total number, the total distance of the zeros we have put, and the dp value. Oh, and also we need one more parameter. Will it be not? Will it not be too? Is it too slow now? Yeah, no, probably it's not too slow. Okay, so the final parameter is consecutive zeros, and let's say total distance here and consecutive zeros, zeros. Whatever. Let's at least be consistent. Yeah. 
so consecutive zeros uh, last consecutive zeros on our prefix. And this value is needed to find like the scoring function to calculate the number of pairs of zeros which don't have a one in between. So number of pairs of zeros without ones in between. Why do I actually write okay ones? Whatever. And so how much is that? It's 40 times 40 times it's not it's not not too it's quite a lot actually. So it's like uh, fifth power of n, but I guess the constant is quite low because we have 40 here, so it's n over 2, it's n over 2 here, and here it's also not so much. But I don't know if there is any... Can we do it faster? I don't know yet. So let's try to implement this at least. I will I will actually get memory limit exceeded if I just implement it with a five-dimensional array. Uh, okay, four-dimensional array. Will I? Yeah, I guess I will. But we can just use two layers as usual. Okay, so one layer will be the number of zeros. Uh, another layer will be total distance is, okay, at most, it's still one here. And last consecutive zeros is, okay, zero as well. And we have zeros. And we also want to find the positions of zeros in A. And we write them down. And the number of zeros is the size of this cent. Count of zeros is the size of this position array. And for each position, we can create a new vector here. Uh, so zeros can be up to i can be up to i plus one after this step. So it's i plus two, we need i plus two here. The total distance will be i plus one times n at most. And last consecutive zeros will be at most i plus one again. So it's okay, something like this. And we can write infinity here. Okay, so let's write it here. In the end, we just swap dp and new dp, and we just loop over zeros. Why do I have these names? Okay, this is a typing test, and I'm failing badly. <laughs> Zeros. I can't even write zeros here because it's not a valid identifier. Why am I doing this? Okay, <laughs> never mind. So, uh, Okay, put zero and uh, put one. We can only put zero if uh, zeros is not is smaller than the count of zeros overall. If we put zeros, then the new number of zeros is zeros plus one. The new total distance is total distance. I don't have out autocomplete. If I had autocomplete, it would be easier, right? Maybe that's why I usually use smaller uh, shorter variable names.
plus one and Uh, does keeping very explicit variable names? No, def I mean, definitely it does help to some extent. You want to have them at least somewhat explicit. But I think that if I was writing this in contest, I would use like Z here for zeros. I would use dist for total distance, maybe even D, but the first letter is usually enough for you to... It, like. You should not use like i, j, k in this case, because j is like what? Like you, you forget about what it means the moment after. Keeping them too explicit is definitely bad for your speed. But in like in this case, in the current circum circumstances, I can just enjoy having as long variable names as I want. And Okay. I will just copy paste. If I put a one, the number of zeros is the same, the distance does not change, and last consecutive dist zeros is zero, and dp value doesn't change. Easy. And finally, if we assume that this is all correct. Um, let's say I want to minimize the scoring function, objective function, and we want let's again uh, okay so the number of zeros is always n, total distance is at most this value which we are interested in and last consecutive zeros can be any value at most count of zeros so minimum of total distance is minimum of dp uh, zeros which is count of zeros total distance and last consecutive zeros, right? And total pairs is count of zeros, count zero minus one over two, and Uh, we output the total number of pairs of zeros minus the result we have found. It is QWERTY. Uh, agility. Maybe it's too fast. Thanks for the compliment. Uh, no. Okay. It's just vector here. Uh, oops. Last consecutive distance, what is that? Awkward. Oof. Ah, uh, okay. I guess the reason is that by making less, we can le make at most this number of swaps. So we have to propagate the answers. Uh, to the right. Okay, this is now correct. And this looks also correct. Okay, let's see. Uh, 
uh, missing an else before the bracket? Uh, no, actually not. It was it was not meant to be else. I have two cases in this DP. I can put a zero or I can put a one. I mean, I can put either a zero or a one, so I have to do both transitions here, both with a zero and with a one. I just put it into a block just to make it more readable and not to reuse the variables, which are the same here. So I just have two blocks in this case, even though this block is not, doesn't have any condition or something. Okay, time limit exceeded. Uh, what? Okay, let's mark it as red. How slow is our solution actually? I think it's not too slow. Um, okay, I guess I can make a test by hand. Okay, 40 zeros and 40 ones, for example. And Let's see how slow it is. Is it actually too slow? Hmm. Yeah, it's super slow. What can I do to optimize it? Yeah, large variable names are the reason, I agree. You're like, yeah. The longer variable names, the slower the solution is. I should have just used one character variable names uh, because of the for loops within for loop within for loops. Yeah, kind of. I mean, I have too many for loops, but can I optimize this solution? Quite a lot. Uh, so it should not be i times n here, right? But maybe also not creating vectors would help. This is what you should obviously do if you want it to run as fast as possible. Not make transitions from unreachable states. But it seems that it's not the main reason. Maybe I'm creating too many vectors. Um, So if I actually use like one one character variables, maybe it's faster. Let's test.
Okay, I can keep this, that part. Yeah, it's actually much faster, right? Not enough, but... <laughs> Just because of shorter variable names, obviously. No, it cannot affect runtime. I think that the reason it affects runtime is just that I don't have extra variables here. But again, like probably if it was optimized well, it would not matter at all. But whatever. Uh, this is how I get the time it takes to run. I output clock. Actually, you should also output it. You should also divide it by clocks per second. But on Windows, it's it outputs just a millisecond. On Linux, you should do it like this. Whatever. Uh, okay. S fast. Let's just let just do it. So total distance is at most n times n. Okay. Minimum of this. Uh, okay, we can also use arrays suddenly, which is not nice, but we can. Um, whatever. And n times n, n. Let's say we have dp and new dp. And we have dp of 0, 0, 0 equal to 0. And let's say we have i plus 1, i plus 1, and i plus 1. We do new dp of v dot c equal to infinity. We update new dp. And here we just set the values. Still too slow. Well, I think my computer is actually not really performing right now. So I can try to submit. But I feel like my solution is not perfect. Um, oh, it passed test case 7. Great. Fifty-six. Easy, easy. I mean, oh, I knew it, I knew it. Uh, easy, 35 milliseconds. I could even make it slower. But yeah, that's how you do it. Maybe actually that's how you don't do it. And I would not <laughs> suggest. Yeah, variable names, longer variable names, it would never pass. Correct. Uh, what rank? I was not doing it virtually. I was, I'm just submitting it into practice, so... No idea. Um, also a lot of memory. Okay, let's read the actual solutions. We can also re read hints. Mm, think or guess when we need exactly this number of operations. Yeah, so this is, this is I guess this is explicit enough understand the solution. Uh, okay. Let's take a pair. Okay. <laughs> nice hint. Next time you will tell your interviewer <clears throat> use short variable names for speed. 
I'm not sure you'll succeed, but right. Uh, D1, maximum D2 is, oh, D1 is maximum for odd, and D2 is maximum for even. Oh, because they just go from left to right. Okay, that's probably easier than what I did. I was just reversing the sign here, as those who were here can remember, because I did this transformation. I took the first element, and then I reversed the signs of all the rest. But instead, if I go from left to right, it's easier, right? That's fair. Okay, code is straightforward. Uh, okay. The setter is... Yeah, use dp is a nice hint, of course. The setter is Belarusian as well. That's true. Uh, okay. So... Let's give a solution for a fixed array and prove it op its optimality. The element is local maximum if... Okay, local minimum. The optimal subsequence will always be an odd length. Okay, that's obvious. And elements with odd numbers shall be located at local maximums and elements with even numbers at local minimums. It's not difficult to see that the first local maximum is always placed earlier than the first local minimum. Okay. Okay. Um, let's start with the case when an element with an odd number is not local maximum. Yeah, so if you consider the permutation like going like local maximum, decreasing to local minimum, increasing to local maximum, and so on, so you have a sequence like this, then maybe it's actually obvious that you should just pick all the maximums and all the minimums and be ready to go. Because it doesn't make sense to pick elements between the minimum and maximum, because you just never improve the result. Uh, the tutorial just said C1DP works here, C2DP doesn't work here, <laughs> right? Okay. So we only take highs and lows into the subsequence. And if we don't add something, then we not make it only worse. Okay, it's a bit different from what I was thinking. The code is similar, but also it has a function similar to what I had. And I think it's, it's nice to have such function makes your code much cleaner and then yeah okay so it's a bit different <laughs> okay it's a bit different approach i wonder if they actually had no segment tree dp solutions written because it's kind of the thing that comes to your mind anyway Okay, so D is, yeah, just this. Oh, three hints to E, right. Let's keep the number of zeros between any pairs of compact and consecutive ones instead of the original arrays. Oh, keep the number of zeros between any pairs of consecutive ones. And swap operation is just move one to the, to the left or to the right. Okay. And just to make sure, so if you are solving the problem and you cannot solve it, then 
It's not like you should read all the hints and then the solution. Maybe if you read hint one, you can figure out the solution. But I mean, I think it will still be a similar DP, but maybe it's easier. I guess it's easier to understand than, my, than mine. And maybe easier to make it faster. Uh, think of number of operations you need. Yeah, sure. Use DP. Nice hint. Some bears. Oh, so it's actually n n n to the power of five. But so it's actually n to five. But my approach, like my solution, was too slow. It's not very nice. I mean, yes, yeah, sure, you can do it, but maybe lower constraints would be would not hurt. Anyway. Mm. Yeah, okay. I see. So it's similar, it's very similar, but just the... We are not building the sequence of zeros and ones, we are instead building the segments of zeros between ones. And okay, so it's n. Okay, so the difference is that it is n to 4 in memory, but my solution was n to 5 kind of in memory, like in, in the number of states of my DP was n to 5, but here it's n to 4 and linear transition. So this approach is faster because of that, I assume. Yeah, it's nice to have editorial with hints. Yeah, I agree. But I'm not sure if it's actually much like useful, but still. Mm. Okay. All right, let's see. Salt C1 without DP, this was easier link. All right. I think it's, yeah, it's finding the local maximum and minimums. It's the second solution. It's the solution from the, the, the editorial basically, but without queries, yeah. Can I throw some light on this problem? Okay, there is a link to a solution in the chat. So hopefully <coughs> people can... Okay, I, I think I will wrap up the stream soon. Uh, could I stream coming kickstart rounds? I've never done any kickstart rounds. Do you think it's a good time to start? Uh, I would suggest trying to read the editorial solution to problem E kickstart streams, but well, you cannot stream them. You can like stream after the round, just maybe right after it ends. I 
I don't even know their schedule, but okay, I'll check. So basically my solution, okay, so just to reiterate on my solution to E, I will like, I, I will not explain it thoroughly, but maybe you can check the video later and maybe it will be more clear, I don't know. So basically the solution is, I want to create the sequence which I want to be in the end. So I have some initial sequence and I want to build the, like I have sequence A and I want to build sequence B of zeros and ones, which has the same number of zeros and the same number of ones. And the first idea is that the number of exchanges required to transform one sequence into another is the total distance of pos between positions of the first zero in A and the first zero in B, the first, the second zero in A to the second zero in B, and so on. So that's the idea that we can easily calculate the number of exchanges required to transform one sequence into another. And then we do DP, which is, we go from left to right, I is the number of positions we have already decided on in sequence B. It has exactly zeros, zeros, and then it has I minus zeros, ones. Uh, total distance is the total distance of zeros we have put to their expected positions. So it's the partial sum of the modulus of differences of positions. And last consecutive zeros is the number of zeros which we have put in our sequence, like in the last, like what is, how many sequence we have at the tail of our current prefix. So it can be zero if the last element is one, or it can be up to zeros if all of them are in the end. And the final idea is that we wanted to optimize some function, which is the number of pairs of zeros which have a one between them. But instead we will calculate the number of pairs of zeros which do not have any ones between them. And that's exactly why we need this parameter, the number of last consecutive zeros. And instead of maximizing the objective function which we were asked for in the problem, we will minimize the number of these pairs. And then the transition is just put a zero, put or put a zero or put a one, and recalculate the values. If you put a zero, the number of zeros increases by one. The distance is changed by the position between the corresponding zero in A and the current position, which is I. Uh, the number of consecutive zeros on the on, on the tail of our prefix is increased by one, and the, the objective function, the number of pairs of zeros, increases by the number of zeros we had on the tail because we have put another zero on the end, so that's what we increase the result by. And if you put a one, it's easier. The number of zeros doesn't change. The total distance doesn't change. The number of zeros at the tail is zero now, and the dp value doesn't change. So we update it and in the end we just use the dp values to find the result, find the like the results for different cases. Uh, kick starts will be too boring for you. It could be. I, I saw some people did them. I will consider it. But I mean division two is Code Forces Division 2 better than Kickstarts? Oh, Kickstart is 2.30 a.m. this time, Moscow time, okay. I guess I will skip it then. Yeah, I keep my GitHub library in mind, but I haven't come to actually update it. Sorry about that. Uh, glad my explanation helped, if it helped. All right, so the contest was actually not bad, I think. I think that problem D is not original, but C is pretty good and E is also fine. B is, B is a nice problem about simple bit operations and A is kind of 
a learning problem about inversions in array. So, yeah. Okay, I think I will wrap up the stream now. Thanks everyone for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. I'm not sure if I will like when the next stream will be, but I will announce as a code forces block. This time I did not announce in advance, actually, I just made an announcement and then just went live at the same time. Maybe that's why I have I might have less viewers if I don't announce it in advance. But I think it's fine. It's easier without announcement for me anyway, in the sense that I just start the stream. Um, I missed a lot of rounds, not just 667. All right, so be sure to follow me on Twitch. If you follow me on Twitch, you will get live notifications about, like if you set up live notifications, you will get notifications when I go live. So you don't miss the next stream. Uh, you can check code forces regularly, especially after <laughs> rated rounds, probably division two rounds. And there is not only me, there are Andrew Ecknerwala, there is Richter, who are streaming both regularly. So check them as well. And so for example, today I think that the Richter was streaming in the morning and Andrew is usually streaming on weekends. So there is a Richter who was streaming today. Yeah, some of the contest, but he's doing it in the morning. So it's a bit different time, but check it out if it's good for you. And Entry is also streaming on weekends. So last weekend he actually did upsolving of IOI. I'm not sure if I if I'm going to do that, but maybe. And yeah. Omnic is not doing streams, I think. Is he? I think he's not, but but he's doing screencasts with commentary. Code forces comment section. Okay. So you can check his playlist as well. Because he's doing a lot of uh Code forces rounds with commentary, explaining it in real time. So, yeah, check it out as well. Uh, William Lin does streams. Actually, I haven't checked them, but sure. I think I, I, I definitely saw his YouTube channel. I didn't know about streams, but right. Okay. But anyway, congratulations to Willem Lin on winning the IY, of course, and hopefully he streams. Uh, more. Second stream. Yeah, but they are also not streaming, right? Oh, he, he's also doing screencasts, right? Okay. Anyway, so thanks everyone for watching and see you next time.